we're writing the plan on the basis that we're we're writing the plan on the basis that nothing happens, but we know something will. And here's our contingencies, and we need we need sort of plan A, B, C, D, and E really, um, depending on the scale and the number and all that stuff. And and all I know is whatever prediction I make will be wrong, but I need to be prepared for it. And the the one advantage 2021 gives us is that we at least know what it kind of looks like. So before when we first went into lockdown, particularly in you know, Australia, New Zealand's quite similar. We didn't know, was that going to be like six months worth? In fact, you know, if you were in Victoria, it, it literally was. Yeah. Um, yet in New South Wales, a bit like New Zealand, it was relatively short, was relatively localised. And it turned out from a financial perspective, at least initially, it didn't devastate us, but it could have. Yep. Um, so, you know, you just look at, again, sort of putting the politics aside, we're so fortunate to live in the countries we do and actually to work in the industry we do because there are many industries that, were, that are still hammered. You know, airlines, you know, mm -hmm. wouldn't want to have a job in an airline at the moment or even some of the tourism based activities yep. uh, or major events. You know, how do you plan a major event when you literally might have to close the day before you have it? And yep. that's it. It's it for the year. You don't have a second chance. So we're very fortunate to be in the industry that we have and to be in the countries we've got. And again, politics aside, because we can all debate about whether they've done the, a good thing or a bad thing, but they've done what they've done. And I can only influence what I can do about that. Very true. Um, I want to I'll, I'll come back to that, but I want you to just if, if, if you could briefly uh, tell us or explain to us with, with reasonable detail as CEO of the Exercise Association of New Zealand and as Chief of Staff of, of IC Reps, um, yes. what what are the day to day responsibilities that you have? So so what you know, with those hats on, um, what are the what are the three to five key bullet point things that you are responsible for? Just so people can get an understanding of what it is to be Richard Betty and what your responsibilities yeah, sure. are. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my core job is around Exercise New Zealand or Exercise Association of New Zealand. And we're the industry body that represents and advocates for the exercise industry in New Zealand. We People often used to say it's the Gym Owners Association. And if you go back 20 years, it probably was. But now we are saying we're here for the exercise industry. So we'll call that structured physical activity in any shape or form. That mainly, of course, still happens in gyms, but it can happen anywhere and it can certainly happen with anyone. So uh, my role is to support the work that our team does yep. to in turn support the industry. So yep. we look at us as a an organization that advocates on behalf of the industry, but is also there to support the industry. And, and a really good example of that, of course, actually is COVID. So, you know, when things like COVID hit us, we need to have a strong association so that we can talk to government, we can develop resources, we can develop advice around COVID. And, it, and it's actually well researched rather than this is what I reckon you should do. This is actually the best evidence both from a safety perspective, but also using it on the other side of the coin to advocate on our behalf to say, actually, this is why we should reopen or this is how we can reopen in a safe environment, given the current uh, situation out there. And so a lot of our work is focused on, I'd often say if I was to paraphrase what we do is we take the stuff that every exercise business in New Zealand will have a challenge with. We do all the homework, spend at times the money, and then share it with everyone. So it's that high idea of, you know, you could develop a health and safety guide for the industry, for your business, sorry, for a couple of thousand dollars. Well, why don't we go away and do it and, and write a template and spend like $15,000 and then share it to everyone in the industry, yep. which, you know, per, per person is, you know, it's 10 bucks each, but not yep. that we charge them because it's part of membership. So this idea of, collaborating on the issues that matter, then you can focus on the stuff that matters just for you. So your business has got its own unique challenges. That's the stuff you focus on. I don't need to get a health and safety guide. Here's one for you. Or here's, a, here's the new employment law updates. Or here's, you name it, 24-hour access. What, what are the do's and don'ts? Here you go. Here's the guide. Because Why? Because we've done the homework. And, we've, and it's not just money. It's often time, actually, for a lot of people to go, I could do this. None of the stuff that we do with perhaps a couple of exceptions of talking to government, someone else couldn't do, but they just don't have the time to. As an independent PT running a small studio, how much do you want to put 20 hours a week into understanding the, the, the changes to the health and safety law or just read our update? Yep. Um, and that's kind of stuff that we go. That, that's what I focus on. Um, and then the other bit is I see reps. And, and so, as you say, it is a bit of a mouthful, hence why it's got an acronym. Um, but it's the International Confederation of all the registration bodies around the globe. New Zealand, Australia are actually two of the first to have formed, um, but there are now registration bodies in around 15 different countries, including the USA, uh, Canada, 
you know, a lot of our training partners. So a lot of the people, a lot of the part places with where New Zealanders and Australians want to go to work. And that's important because yep. one of the biggest benefits that the Confederation does is gives a portability arrangement globally. So you can train in Australia and work in New Zealand. And we've all probably seen examples where if you've been in an Uber or a taxi and you ask someone what they do for a living, especially if they are, I'll say a foreigner, they've recently come into the country and they'll tell you the story about how they used to be an engineer back in insert country, whatever. And, or, and you go, oh, really? So why do you not do it? Oh, well, they don't recognize my PhD over here. And you go, oh, that's kind of sad. Um, mm -hmm. Now, again, without going knowing the details of why, but in our industry, we actually have global portability. Now, it's, it's not simple. It does depend on what you did and where you did it and the levels you've got to. But the fact that there is a recognition process without having to retrain is just so powerful. So I see reps is about um, collaborating globally but we use the national registration body. So we've got Exercise New Zealand with reps. We've got an Australia, Fitness Australia, but there are globally, I say there's about 15 of them. And, and, it's, and it's really exciting to see as an example, and I often compare it with a sporting, um, sporting field, where on a sporting field, Australia and New Zealand will compete you know, and we want to beat you, and we generally do, right? That's just how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, just don't talk about cricket, but these days, actually, we're going okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, there, there's lots of sports you beat up, but we, we love to do, and we like we like to win, and, you know, we, we win occasionally and all that stuff. It's all good. But at the end of the day, we are competing. Mm. With the exercise industry, we're cooperating. There, there is no competition, and particularly when you're geographically far away, that actually a PT in, in Sydney and a PT in Auckland is not only not competing, but actually they're, fa they're facing the same challenges. So if we can work together, whether it be on qualification recognition or that bigger picture stuff, which we might get to in a moment about, you know, how do we get more people physically active and what we're we going to do about it? And what can we do at a policy level all the way through to what can a trainer or a club do to get more people in through the door? Um, that stuff, well, that's about collaborating. That's not about competing. And, and, and to me, that is one of the big differences with our industry compared with many others and not just sporting, but pretty much every other industry. If you're, if you're a hotel, ultimately you're competing with the next hotel. You might collaborate to try to get more tourists, but at the end of the day, when they get here, you're competing for the same number of people. We aren't. We still have 80% of the population that don't use our product. We have a huge opportunity. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. There's a couple of questions I, I want to ask off the back of what you've just said there. Now, again, um, without without uh, dwelling too much on 2020, but but it, it is still relevant to, to how we operate in today and, and the fitness field. But uh, what were your observations of how government and your body and the fitness industry at large, what were your observations of how that all worked to overcome the challenges of last year? Because to give you some background, in Australia it was very different depending on what state you lived in or, yeah. or operated in, right? The, the experience was very different in Victoria as opposed to New South Wales, as opposed to Queensland and so on and so on. Um, <clears throat> did you see in New Zealand, was there a good connection between government uh, representative body and gym owner? Did, did, did those three parties all come together and work pretty well? Look, overall, again, if you're trying to give it a you know pass or fail, I'm going to give it a big pass on all, all of those three components, and I'll, I'll layer into that in a minute. Um, and going back to what you said in Australia, we you know we observed exactly that. One of the biggest challenges in Australia was the state decision making. Yep. Um, and in fact, even a better example is 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 the United States. Yes. Yeah, that's probably a good example of how not to do it. And not only do you have a, 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 you know, if, a, what, at the time, the federal government was in a complete mess because they were literally in denial. You had states trying to, in part, put some controls, and then you'd have a layer below them, cities going, well, actually, you know, I was a Republican uh, mayor, so I'm going to say no. And then you get a little county within a city going, yes, but we're back to, we oh. want to have masks. And you're going, so sorry, you say no, you say yes, you say sometimes, and you say uh, you have to be closed. I don't know. Uh, and so, the, the, and it's complicated enough in, in the best of times because, you know, first of all, I may not agree with all of those things. I certainly going to disagree with some of them. 
But to even understand what am I supposed to do mm. is near impossible. And so Australia was a version of that, certainly better than America, but saying better than America in a COVID environment is not really much of a compliment. And, and Victoria was a good example of a, of a, I'm going to say a government, and I can be critical because they're not my government, of a government that would not listen to the science. Mm. And that's, that's a fault. I call that, that's the government's fault. That was not a fault of anyone else's. You know, I, I know some of the work that was being done behind the scenes, um, and it just they just refused to engage. And yet you had New South Wales next door with a similar problem at similar times, doing, you know, still doing similar things. They were doing controls, they were doing lockdowns, more regional and smaller. But at the end of the day, they still had the same tools at their disposal. But the way they engaged with industry seemed to be completely it was it was chalk and cheese. Um, yeah. So back to New Zealand. Um, one of the things that was really useful, and again, if I, it's always easy in hindsight to look back. But what happened was very quickly the large gyms all sort of gathered around, and we had, I think, for the first time in the last ten years, you know, we were having weekly Zoom meetings, just going, "What's up?" And mm. it was more. To start with, certainly the first couple of weeks of what we call lockdown, because we only had one major lockdown where where everything pretty much was closed, including everything other than the supermarket, basically. How, how supermarket long was that? GPs. How long was that that initial and pretty much only lockdown for? I do remember New Zealand going yeah. down very hard. How long was that for? Yep. So four or five weeks of what we call level four, which is basically everything's closed. And then level three, where our industry is still closed, but a few things can reopen slowly. So still no retail, still no gyms. That was another three weeks. So it was sort of about that seven, eight weeks. Yep. Now in hindsight, if we're only going to close for eight weeks. You almost go, well, good, I'll have a holiday. But of course, at the time, we're thinking, is this going to be six months of closure? Like literally not knowing how long it was going to be was the biggest factor and also not knowing we were we all learned about COVID we all became sort of semi-experts at it you know to start with you know everyone was worried about the door handle and then we, yeah. we kind of learned that actually not to say you shouldn't wash that door handle but actually that's not the main virus transmission vector we mm -hmm. actually know it's airborne and that's we knew that from the beginning but we never actually said well actually 95 percent of it comes from the air oh okay mm -hmm. but we learned that sort of three months in right and that and that, I say we learned that just through the media, through science, through the stuff that we did at, at our workplace. Um, and so one of the things we did really well as an industry was to just start to talk and say, well, well what are the issues? Now, we're all closed, but what does that mean? And, and what is our approach? You know, we were thinking, do we want to go straight to the consumer and tell them, support your gym, keep paying your membership? That was a, a discussion point. Maybe yep. that was a solution yep. to our industry. Just mm -hmm. keep getting members to pay. That, and that's not a, a bad thing to think about. But then you go maybe we'll just look like we're after your money and we mm. don't care. So there's a, everything has a, the other side to it. You could twist this, particularly if it goes into the media in a negative context. Um, and we, we had lots of discussions about stuff that we never did, but, but it was really important very early on. We all agreed having a very clear framework for our industry around all the details of the do's and don'ts would be very useful. And so from the, and this was that industry driven thing. So we actually ended up making, we're calling it a framework, but it was all of the rules for what you do in a club and a trainer and at a boot camp, anything to do with exercise about COVID at the various levels. But interesting enough, we put it out 48 hours before the government did. And it was a very, very risky thing because we've just said what you should do. And we haven't heard from the government yet. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we knew that the government can override us. So if we say, let's just use an example, we say one metre is okay, you can have 50 people in our class, and they say, no, it's two metres and you can have 20 people, well, we're blown out of the water, we better change our, our framework. Yep. But we based it on science, and so we went specifically for specific scenarios in our sector. So Group X is different to one-on-one. -on -one. Gym environment is different to, to, a, to a Group X environment. Even though there might be 40 people in a room, you're standing next to the same person for an hour, you're moving around over here. Is yep. that better? Is that worse? What are the risks? You know, Fans over here and, and ventilation are major factors over here, less so because, in fact, uh, again, less the fans are blowing from one person to another. It's a different risk factor. And again, yep. this is not my opinion or what I reckon. We engaged what's called a clinical protocol designer. Their whole job is not a virologist because there's lots of virologists talking in the media and they do know about viruses. What they don't know about is developing protocols to prevent them because that's not their job. Um, and so this particular person, this is what they did for a living. And so we engaged them. We said, here's our problems. We've got group X. 
where we cram people into a room together, sometimes with with poor ventilation, like a like a bike studio. Yep. Here, we've got one on one where someone stands in front of someone for an hour, facing them, breathing on them. Now these are not bad. Pre COVID, you'd say you'd never describe a personal training session like that, yep. but I'm I'm describing it in a COVID context. It absolutely is. Mm. Uh, and here's the other layer: increased respiration. Now that's something that is unique almost to our industry. And I'm not saying these are all bad things, but they are all issues we need to to overcome. Yep. And so we developed a framework around it, got on the details, and, and we wanted to be also very nuanced and detailed. So we wanted to give guidance on whether you should do blood pressure checks at what we call level two, which is when you can open, but there's still controls. Should you be touching the person and doing all that stuff? Everyone, you know, now there's you can answer it either one of two ways. Yes, you can do these things, or just for the sake of it, don't do it because it's only going to be a week. So yep. we came up with frameworks and models for all of those little nuanced things. Should you turn the saunas off? Should you have water coolers because they're touch points? All that sort of stuff. So the government, of course, never has a position on those things because they're way too detailed. Yeah. And the other thing that we did at the same time was to go to government and say, here is our framework. We've got it. We've, we've solved your problem for you guys. Now, I say it was high risk initially because the other thing that we ended up doing was we went above and beyond the government. So the government says, for example, in gyms, one meter is okay in, a, in a, what we call level two, controlled environment. There might be a risk of COVID transmission in the community. We say one meter is okay on the gym floor, one and a half is better, but in group exercise, it's two meters. And why two meters? Because you're, you're in prolonged proximity to the same person. And all of the virus information tells us that if you're there the more than 15 minutes in a clinical setting, they say you're very high risk of transmitting at one meter. So you make it two meters, you you about you have it. Now again, it's not about what I think. This is what the experts tell us, and we say therefore two meters. Now, every major gym chain in New Zealand got on board with that, and yep. that is fantastic because they could have easily said, yeah, but one meter we can fit fifty in the class. At two meter we can only fit twenty, and that's going to hurt our business. Mm. So from the very beginning, we were front footing this by saying, hey, government, we're doing more than you ask, and we continue to deliver more than you ask. We had a mask policy in May. The government had a mask policy in November. Right. Now, I'm not criticizing the government here. I realize they have a lot on their plate. The gym industry is not the most important industry in the world for them. I mean, I believe it is, but, but yeah. that's me and yeah. I'm advised, right? And, and this is the problem with a lot of people who go, but you don't understand we're essential. And, you know, I, I, I am one of the most passionate um, advocates for the exercise industry. But if I'm really honest, I'm sorry, you're not essential for the next week because mm-hmm. we're closing things down for a week week and I totally get that is painful and it's and it, I totally get that you are trying to help people and I totally get the product is amazing and all that stuff we live in a COVID world where actually we need to close the businesses down for a week and if we're essential then so is physiotherapists mm-hmm. and so are chiropractors and they're closed mm-hmm. I and mean, elective surgery doesn't happen in our country at level three so in other words you know that's that's pretty serious stuff that I think that's pretty essential so we're in the same category as them we're also in the same category as retail and I get we're more important than them. But this isn't a competition here. It's like saying the government's trying to stop all transmission by basically stopping businesses from having people. Yep. And that, that is their, their challenge is to say, you know, and the word essential always is it's almost like the wrong word. It's like saying, are you important? Well, yeah. everyone's important. Yeah. Um, but can we close for a week and, and will the people be okay? They, they will, but we just need to be, well, how do I engage with them and keep them, keep them out my customer, even if they're not paying me for that week? There's a financial consideration, but then more importantly, there's a retention consideration because that's going to matter way more than the one week's lost revenue. And maybe you can deliver something online. That's a whole different conversation. Yep. But assuming you're just going to say, right, for a week, I'm not getting any revenue. Ouch, that really hurts. 2% of my revenue for the year is gone. But now I will need to think of how do I keep my members engaged so I don't lose 10% of my um, customer base in a week. Yep. Which is... A, so that's, um, that's the balance. I've, sorry, I've gone all over the place in terms of no, your that's question. Okay. No, 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 it, you, that's fine. I, I want to ask you this. When you were going through this process, especially in the early stages of, um, uh, of dealing with, uh, with coronavirus and everything else that it brings with it, was there ever a point where you, because uh, it happened to me once or twice, um, <laughs> a little embarrassed to admit, but there were points where I sat down and actually there was a fleeting moment where I'm like, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to navigate this. I, you know, as a business owner, there were there were a couple of moments where I sat by myself and just there was just this thought where I'm like, I'm just not sure how I'm going to actually 
find the answer to this one. This one's a tricky problem. Did you ever have a moment to, to yourself where you're like, oh, geez, uh, I'm not sure we can get through this without sustaining some serious damage? Or did you always feel like there was a way to navigate it? Um, it's probably both. I, I'd say, but it wasn't a moment, it was a period. Yeah. I would say that first four to six weeks, I don't know how we're going to get through it, but I know we will. Mm. And I didn't, for the first time, I didn't know what we were going to do. Mm. I, you know, I didn't, I knew we had to work together. I knew we'll have to talk to government. We knew that, be, but they were making it up as they go along. In fact, one of the, yeah. one of the government agencies I spoke to sort of said, we're in a plane at the moment, but we're still building the wings. <laughs> And that's what we do. We, we have to start doing stuff yeah. and then making it up as you go along. And the one thing that became very, very apparent is that what people wanted was clarity. Yep. And so going back to a trivial example, everyone was asking us, what do I do with saunas? And so we just said, look, we spoke to a protocol designer. and I said, look, saunas do have heat. Heat kind of kills the virus, but not straight away. Just turn them off because we're only talking about a week, maybe two after your level three, which is closed. You have a week of level two or maybe two weeks and then you're back to normal. Just keep the saunas off for that couple of weeks. And so we just said, saunas are off at level two. And everyone said, thank you. Now, we could actually argue, debate, whether or not go, it doesn't matter. They just wanted the answer. Mm -hmm. And so you could definitely have a protocol that goes all into the details of how you would manage a sauna at level two and how you keep it safe. But it's just simpler to give them the answer. So one of the things we began to realize was that clarity mattered more than a lot of things. So yep. to say yes or to say no actually gave people so because then i can just get on with my business of saying put the sign on the sauna it's closed next what do i do with the, my, my uh you know four to four um, benches and taps next to each other and so all of that stuff because there were millions of questions that everyone had in terms of their business and the last thing we want to do is you having to dwell on something as trivial as a sauna or for that matter a tap in your in your staff room yeah and so we spend a lot of time going through like, yeah, this is this is good. We've, we've got, and, and then you start to go, yeah, we're getting good feedback on this thing and this area. And then before you know, it's like this framework, we, we made the call really early on, which was kind of unusual. We're a membership-based organization. We don't get government money. Mm -hmm. We get money from our members and that's how we survive. Yep. We made the call early on. We said, we're going to give this framework to the industry, not our members, to everyone. Now that could piss off our members because they go, why the hell do I pay you if you're going to give it away? But in hindsight, it was the best thing we did because so many people saw what we did and said, oh, that's why you exist. So it was never the intent. Through COVID, we grew 25%. Wow. Now, I can tell you this. We didn't grow 25% revenue. Our revenue was down because mm -hmm. lots of people didn't have money. So we said sure. to every club, if you don't have money, don't pay us, sort it out later. Now, as long as there is an intent to pay something later, well, don't worry. But in terms of our membership base, it actually grew 25%. And yep. in our entire history of the organization, we've never grown that much in a year. So and it was it, funny, it was never the intent. We weren't even doing it as a growth strategy at all. Mm -hmm. We were doing it as a, this is the right thing to do. Um, and back to your question about, do you ever think, you know, this is going to be the end? I had a couple of scenarios. You know, scenario one was, was our best case was, we're going to have a, like a 50% revenue drop this year. We're going to sort of, probably hopefully not lay off any staff but probably a couple and also by the way uh, we're thinking between 15 and 30 percent of the clubs in New Zealand will close right now that was kind of our we thought best case scenario now mm -hmm. turned out boy oh boy was I wrong and I'm glad I'm wrong because we had a handful of clubs in New Zealand close right our revenue was down about 20 percent and actually we didn't have to let any staff go and on the whole the industry has survived it now again individuals are still hurting and I'm not belittling sure. anyone who says it's tough out there. It can be. Sure. Um, but the reality is that as an industry, we survived it. Now that was because like at the beginning, we thought there's no way if you'd asked me a year and a bit ago, would the government ever close the economy? You'd say, of course not. They never do. It doesn't matter how bad things get now again, wrong, but I, you're baking, but we make assumptions, right? And so we were now doing the other one. Okay. COVID's hit. Oh my God. They've just closed the economy. What's it going to do to us? It's probably going to screw us. Let's do a plan for that. Yep. Um, yep. So I def, definitely early on was I, I don't know what we're going to do. I do know we need to be here to help. Yep. And also, I don't know if we're going to be around to survive. There was a very real possibility. But I, one of the things I did say to someone on our board actually was, look, this is the time to use all of our funds. And if we end up using all of our funds, trying to help the industry for as long as we can, 
then that's what we should do right now because you don't want to hold on for that rainy day because I'm pretty sure it's raining right now. Yeah, that's today is exactly. the rainy day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I agree. That's a very, very smart thing. I, I think also too, Richard, um, what's off the back of this, uh, I feel like uh, in, in Australia and the experience is probably fairly similar in New Zealand, it's, it's been an opportunity for a lot of operators, business owners, gym owners, business operators to have a very critical analysis of how their business is, how it functions, how tight it is, its procedures, its policies, its financial management, et cetera, et cetera. And I think for those that have survived in Australia and New Zealand, it sounds like New Zealand has done exceptionally well too, by the way, uh, off the back of all of this, I think a lot of gym owners and operators will have much healthier, more viable businesses because it forced them to really do a strong audit on every aspect of what they do. Is that is that something that you've seen or, or, or heard of? Yeah, absolutely. What, when you're saying this, I know it's a podcast, but I was just nodding the whole time. It's mm. absolutely spot on. I think, you know, the, the one good thing, I always, I always try to look for the good in anything. You know, there, there's been a couple of good things about COVID in terms of from a business perspective, forcing every business to go through and go, what would you do? I mean, we, we all know what we did. Literally items, I mean, in our business plan, we just said, we're not doing that. That gets crossed out. The, the activity and, and the revenue stream and the expense, it's gone. We just don't do that anymore. Now, you'd ask prior to COVID, you go, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't possibly drop it completely. There'll be riots in the street if we do that, or, or we'll have to close. It won't work. Um, and you realize, yes, yes, you can. And whether that means making that hard call you knew you should have always made anyway, or actually just looking really closely and going, you know, again, you know, back to the sort of 80-20 rule that people often will say, you know, where am I getting my money from? And what about these other things? Now, they might be useful in the long term. But maybe it's not right right now. You know, this whole idea discussion around virtual uh, or some, you know, just outside of your box um, service offerings. I think that's really important. Um, the other thing I think it's taught us, which I think is a huge positive, and I still see, and I, I, want, I want to be, well, I say I want to be wrong. I think I am right, but I stand to be corrected if it is. I am wrong. I think all the proponents in America and Europe saying virtual is a major thing moving forward are fundamentally wrong. Now, that doesn't mean to say it won't be a thing. It will be a thing, and it will be a small thing. Why? Because fundamentally, our product is about human interaction. Now, I, I, I hope I'm right in that one, not because it's just about me being right, because that's why I believe what makes us good, because otherwise we are basically competing with YouTube and the best YouTuber or the best Instagrammer or the best whatever. And by the way, your platform is, is more polished than my platform. Therefore, you're going to look better than me um, and you can hire the better people. But if, if you look at this, what it is about is human interaction. Why do we go? We know it in Australia, New Zealand. We've gone back to gyms. We've gone back to our cafes. We've gone back to, you know, sitting down with friends and going around to dinner. And you're going, why? You could have, why didn't you go virtual dinner parties like you did during lockdown? Well, because they're not as good, mm. you know, and the same thing with a personal interaction. Yes, I can get some advice off the internet. We can do this kind of interview. Isn't it great? I don't have to fly to Australia to do it. But, you know, tell you what, sitting down and having a beer on a Friday afternoon would be a way more um, human way of connecting with you as a person. Yeah. And so yeah. That, that I think that is a really good thing for our industry because it was always part of what made our industry unique was that interaction with human beings and particularly in this digital space where we've got more friends on Facebook than we've ever had, yet we're lonelier than we ever were. And that's probably a whole discussion for another podcast. But sure. I think we're a solution to that problem. You know, I'm, I'm always looking at, okay, yeah, you've got a problem, but what are we within that context? So it's like dentists with tooth decay. They're the solution, they're not the fault, even though they're one's fixing it. The same thing here. We've got lots of societal problems, and some of them are health-related. Some of them are uh, socially related. Some of them are, you know, we talk about obesity, type 2 diabetes stuff all too often. Um, but, you know, mental health would be the big one, I would say, right now in a COVID world, we all suffer from various levels of, oh shit, life is terrible right now. And it could be someone's died. It's probably not likely to be that in New Zealand or Australia, but certainly in other countries, we're literally, I know, you know, we probably all know friends who an actual close relative died or several family members. You go, you forget that because in New yeah. Zealand and Australia, yeah. that's not a major thing. Yeah. That together with, and by the way, I lost my job. It's a pretty shit year, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's okay to be shit in that environment. I'm beginning to sound like Craig Harper now. Um, he would probably say another word before the shit, wouldn't he? <laughs> now, look, you're touching on so many, so many key points. It's hard to know um, 
with 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 that where to take it because you you, you just yeah you you you've hit the, mon- the the nail on the head. The thing I noticed was that um, people started to acknowledge that the fitness industry was a great deal more about appearances and workouts and um, the aesthetic outcomes it, it people started to understand that the fitness industry develops and delivers a, a, a lot more than that i want to ask off the back of what you just said do you feel like the new zealand population as as a country is more aware of the importance of being um uh, self-reliant and and individually responsible for their health going forward and, and i ask that because in australia i've been um singing it from the from the treetops for as long as i can about people taking responsibility for their own health and and being and making exercise habitual now some people some people will do that and some people will eventually find that and some people will never find that but what's been the outcome in the new zealand population is there a is there a groundswell of 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 interest in taking more care of ourselves physically so that we're in a better um, space, a better a better position to uh, ward off the situations like a, a virus that can kill. So I think if I was to look at this as a continuum, where at one end you know we're worse off, no one no one cares now, everyone thinks it's the government's responsibility to fix everything, through to everyone is now personally responsible for their own health, including the the value of exercise, a good diet healthy lifestyle all those all the things that we know one should do to oneself and you are entirely within your control um i'd say we're not at i haven't seen a fundamental change and again this is very much anecdotal i haven't seen a fundamental change in people's belief that it is their responsibility to do it but what i have seen is this huge awareness of the benefit and i'm going to call it physical activity rather than just exercise what that plays in I'm going to say mental wellness, but by just how you feel. Yep. And the reason that I say that is that in New Zealand, I'm not sure, I, I'm pretty sure it was in Australia, and I've heard a couple of rules in, in, in the UK when there were lockdowns. Even when the, the, the strictest lockdown existed, you aren't, can't go out of your house. There were generally exceptions of going to your doctor, possibly going to the supermarket, there were rules around that, and you could exercise. Yep. Now, you couldn't go to the gym, you couldn't exercise with others outside your bubble, if that was the language you used in your country, but you could exercise. And I think that's really powerful because a whole bunch of people that never experienced exercise or structured physical activity for probably 20, if not 40, if not 50 years, did it. Yep. All they did was went for a walk. Now, they didn't go to the gym and they didn't do push-ups in the park and they certainly didn't do a boot camp. Um, some of them did. That was probably the regular people, but they're doing it anyway. They so almost move on from them because once the gyms reopen, they go back. But there's a, there's a huge subset, which is the majority, are not doing anywhere near enough and probably do nothing. And they, for the first time in their modern lives, mm. experienced, oh, I went out, I went for a walk, and I felt better. Mm-hmm. Now that, to me, how much would I pay to go, I'm going to do that to every Kiwi? Or of the 5 million Kiwis, I'm going to get 3 million of them to experience that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know. I haven't done the survey, but I, I guarantee, because I went for a walk around my suburb during lockdown. Boy, oh boy, first of all, people smile at you. They're saying hello, although we'd kind of walk away on the footpath because we had to. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're going to kill me if you get too close. And it was, it was sort of funny because we are being nice, but it's like, I don't think I – can our dogs sniff each other? I'm not sure <laughs> Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was, yeah. it was a bit yeah. weird, but it was also, also we, we, we were actually being nice because you're the only human I've seen outside the people in my house and I'm kind of sick of them, yeah. um, you know, if, if I'm honest. Yeah. And, um, and the fact that we all did this was so, so powerful. And I think it's a huge opportunity for us in the industry to leverage off. So back to your question, I don't think we've kind of got to the stage where people are saying, therefore I am responsible for my own wellness and exercise is going to be part of it but they did experience a taster of it. They did something that was good for them for whatever reason. Maybe they just want to get out of the house, but they experienced it and maybe they got their heart rate from you know their normal 90 to up to 120. Um, and I realized for most people, heart rate's not normally 90. You go, it is for some of these people. Yeah. Uh, and so they, they went for that walk and they got a bit of an elevated heart rate and maybe they just put a bit of oxygen through their body and probably mm-hmm. some of it went to their brain and you go, feel quite good. Yeah. Good. Great. You could do that again. 
And you could do that again with, let's just say, intensity or with some structure or with some personalization. And by the way, that's my job. That's what I can do for you. You know, yeah. I come yeah. to my studio, to my program, to my class, come to my yoga thing, come to my boot camp. I don't care. Whatever it is that you are passionate about, or for that matter, if you're an individual, you can now do that to yourself. Or maybe you'll join the gym or you'll go to that yoga class. Find that thing that will resonate most with you. Um, and that to me, I, I could not pay enough money to get that experience to probably, if, if it's not every Kiwi, it's sort of two thirds of them. Yeah. And by the way, I'm going to force you to not be at work during that time as well. So again, I'm, I'm looking for that silver lining to the cloud. Um, but it's going to be unique and it's going to be short lived because here's the thing. We all forgotten about COVID sort of almost now and going, you know, when it happens a new level change, you're going, oh, yeah, that's right. Are we supposed to? Do? I can't remember what it's like. Yeah. Wait, we only did it six months ago. Yeah. So this will be lost. So we've got a unique opportunity to go because let's face it, we are emotional creatures. We decide we 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 make decisions emotionally, although we like to ju ju justify them logically, especially men. Um, but the reality is we're emotional creatures. If we can harness that feeling that people had when they went for the walk and remember, get them to remember it. And it just could be, I felt a bit better. I got out of the house. Right. Well, let's let's un unpick that onion of why the different components of getting out of the house would have helped you. But one of them will be blood flow, blood flow, flow through your body, particularly to your brain. Yep. We yep. can do that again. Let me help you. Yep. Yep. No, I agree. I think my own experience with my own facility is that there's definitely been a segment of the population uh, that I've never seen before in my facility that I've, that have come to the gym uh, and, and are looking for other opportunities to remain active, stay active, try some different activity, try something else. You know, they know that walking is great, but walking has limitations and also too, it can yeah. get a little bit boring too, but, but I mean, it's something, something's better than nothing. Um, one foot, one uh, final question. Uh, has, has your industry or your association um, being the exercise association of New Zealand, have you moved up the pecking order when it comes to having a voice or a direct line to, to government now that now that we understand that that being active is good for our mental health being active is good for our physical health having good physical health boosts our immune system boosting our immune system makes us more uh, less sorry less susceptible to all of this so there's a definite correlation and connection here do you have a stronger voice now with the government of New Zealand um, you know at the table of, of of policy setting and things like that we do, um, but it is very much baby steps. Uh, it's interesting. I've, I've had a couple of, a number of global meetings recently around, you know, us doing this kind of stuff globally and collaborating. And one of the discussions points, a lot of people say, oh, we're part of the health sector. And, and I can disagree with that. Not because of all the things you just said about the health outcomes that we deliver. We're not the health sector, but we deliver health outcomes. And there's a difference because yep. the health sector is, is driven by health professionals that are regulated with you know, uh, degrees, possibly multiple degrees, with seven years of training. Uh, you know, we're talking about doctors, but certainly at least three or four years of training. And their whole structure is regulated. It's predominantly government funded, certainly in most of the Western world. Again, uh, America put to the side. So there's, a, there's an existing structure and model, and we're not part of that. Now you go, do you want to be part of that? I don't think we do because mm. it's a different thing. And and But I do believe our product provides health benefits. And there's mm. a difference between being in the health industry and providing health benefits. Because the other thing is, as you said, some of the people who are now joining your club just want to be active. Now they will get health benefits from that, but they just kind of like, I wanted to feel it. And you even ask them to describe it. I'm not sure everyone would describe the same thing even. It's like when you do a yoga class, 20 people in a yoga class getting 20 different benefits mm. from the same fundamental product. And so um, back to kind of our seat at that table, we are very fortunate just recently in the last year, a little bit before COVID, uh, our registration body reps, Register of Exercise Professionals, got a seat at the table of what's called Allied Health Aotearoa. Now at that table sits physiotherapy in New Zealand, chiropractor in New Zealand, podiatrists in New Zealand, uh, audiologists, um, social workers, um, physical, um, I can't remember their names actually, they, but, but there's, there are so many different uh, uh, health professionals that are not doctors or nurses because that's basically primary health care in New Zealand. Yep. You, you've got your, your allied um, health professionals, allied, allied health professionals. All of them are at seat at the table. Yep, we're the only non true health sec group at that table. But here's the other interesting point we're the second biggest group. Mm -hmm. So the only 
one that has more people is physios. And if we look at the stats, we're going to pass them in about, in about a year's time. Now, it's not about who's biggest, but it's if you talk about now the ability to have impact on New Zealand and the New Zealanders and their behaviour, because let's face it, it isn't just about exercise. When you talk about gym now or a studio, it's like, yes, we can help you in that, but can we influence what people eat? Can we help them to give up smoking? Can we improve them on their, you know, maybe just mental health journey about getting them the right help? And by the way, we're not the ones who will deliver it. Our product can help, but also I can help you with these people because these people are the ones who will actually help you, you know, counselling or whatever it might be, social workers. Yeah. Um, yep. Because all of these organisations have a seat at the table too. Yep. So this is where the real power comes. And so it is baby steps. You know, I, I think we've done great work in New Zealand to get to that point. And part of it is about credibility of our sector, not just of our organisation, because we're always judged by the lowest common denominator and the you know, yourself, the people that do what you do, probably many of the people listening to this podcast, get already the wellness angle of exercise. And yet there are some that still in our industry come from, I'll call it old school, and it's okay to be old school, mm -hmm. except if it's damaging to our, to our industry. Mm -hmm. And so if the idea of you just have to slam your body, you push it as hard as you can, and it's all about how you look. And by the way, here's the diet, which actually will help you lose weight, but it'll actually hurt you. Mm -hmm. that's that's not good for anyone because now you're giving out dietary advice you're going outside your scope all this sort of stuff you know it's a whole different conversation for another day yep. but the vast majority of people who actually genuinely care for their clients don't go into that space but we are judged by that yep. so it's the old story of the cowboys unfortunately give us a bad reputation but the good news is they are a small subset and i would say yep it's the same as there's also rednecks in america but that doesn't make america a bad place mm -hmm. so there's there are people in every industry that may not do what we think is right for people or for that industry and we just need to make sure that we do all the right thing like having a registration body having standards and then following them and then where you don't agree with the standards give input and change them um, i do hear a lot of exercise professionals particularly you know in australia they'll say oh i don't like this what fitness australia does well then join them and change it yeah uh, excuse my language don't bitch and moan about it um and if because they are your industry body there's only one of them don't um, don't don't uh, don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution. I think yeah, is, is, is generally yeah. the one. Look, Richard, yeah. I thank you. It, it sounds to me like, you know, under under your uh, under your guidance uh, and leadership, it sounds like um, the uh, the exercise and and fitness industry of New Zealand has navigated and negotiated their way through the the last twelve months in an exceptional fashion. I think it's amazing. Um, I, I also think that it's really valuable for people to hear from someone like you. As I said at the top of the show, you know you're you're a person that sits um, at an administrative and and um, policy level, and you are the you know people like you are the ones that guide how the industry operates, how it manages itself, how it checks itself, how it uh, uh, audits itself. So you know if we've got people like yourself um, at the top of those organisations, as you are in New Zealand, I think the the fitness industry in in general in New Zealand is in very good hands. Fascinating to hear how you managed the last 12 months. I appreciate that. Um, if, if, um, if people, if people are, are looking to move over to New Zealand to opt to operate and work in the industry and they're qualified in Australia, is there a basic process they need to go through? Is there some way, you know, what, what's the process for, for people that want to do that? Yeah, really good question. So our, our portability partner, as we yeah. call it in, in Australia, is Fitness Australia. So anyone registered with Fitness Australia can come to New Zealand. They then go to Reps New Zealand, which is part of Exercise New Zealand, and simply say, here's my registration certificate from Australia. And what's really important is we say registration is portable, not qualification. Now, qualification got you registration, but it's a yep. registration that's the portable bit because we understand that that registration level maps to this registration level for us. And then you can register in New Zealand with no further uh, issues. So there may be where's your current first aid and that's literally it. Yep. So that's a very seamless process. And obviously at the moment, travel is somewhat difficult. Uh, mm. Although if you happen to be a New Zealand resident, you could get in. Mm. Um, but you know, we know that New Zealand, Australia, we have the, the largest workforce of any exercise industry in fact, globally, for the size of our population that, that move, which yep. is great. You know, lots of trainers train in New Zealand, work in Australia, and vice versa. Yep. Um, and yep. that's a positive thing, especially we've got a relatively young industry and therefore a young workforce, I should say, and therefore that ability to move is really pretty cool. Um, but that's the way you do it. And then just contact reps and New Zealand reps.org.nz. Um, again, you can, you can phone someone or drop them an email and say, This is where I'm at. This is what I want to do. And every major employer in New Zealand 
uh, almost bar none requires registration with reps. So it's also your kind of ticket to get an interview. It won't get you the job, but it will make sure that you will possibly be considered for the job because without it, it's going to go, well, I've got the yeses and the noes piles. You're easily in the no pile if you don't, if you're not registered. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. It's uh, It's been great. I appreciate your time and, and insight. Um, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to seeing how New Zealand uh, pushes forward from here. New Zealand's always been a country that has punched above its weight. I mean, uh, you've only got to look at the rugby union. We, we, we can't beat the All Blacks. And, and I think, well, I know in the last cricket series there in the T20 series, uh, it was a 3-2 victory to New Zealand as well. So we've got a bit of work to do over here in Australia. Yeah, well, I could think, back to what we were saying earlier, look, one of the advantages is we're, we're small and so we're a job. Um, it's like a small business against a big business. I always think a small business can win because they can be agile and change and, and spin on a dime if needed. Um, and so, you know, in terms of wherever someone is at, most people work in small businesses. Yeah. So, you know, let's look at that as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. You may not have the million dollars of capital behind you, but you then have the ability to go, if we want to move, if we want to change, if we want to completely rebrand all of our products. We can do that tomorrow if we want to, uh, because at the end of the day, we can decide that this is the new direction we want to do and just do it. And that's a bit like New Zealand because we don't have lots of states. We don't have, you know, city councils basically have no say in what happens, which is a good thing when you're trying to do everyone get this together. I mean, our prime minister talked about the team of five million. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're all in it together kind of stuff. Now, again, politics aside, because it's not about whether or someone voted for Jacinda or not. Um, the fact that we're on first name basis with our prime minister is always a good sign, right? Yeah, that's right. That's it. Auntie Cindy is what we call it. But I think apparently that that is now regarded as derogatory, so we're not supposed to say it. So if you can just edit that out of the podcast, otherwise I'll lose my job. <laughs> right on, mate. Richard, thanks for your time. We'll talk to you again another time. Cheers, a pleasure. Thanks, Russell. See you, mate. <laughs> You're funny. That's funny. Uh, Auntie Cindy, was it? <laughs> that's, that's right. People, because she was kind of,